press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss another update. China and India are the two most important developing countries, and they have been brought closer through the platform of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. For years, there have been predictions about the future relations dwelling on rivalry between the dragon and the elephant, in particular during the Doklam standoff in early 2017. So could the elephant and the dragon dance together, perhaps through the BRICS summit? How will the two countries' relations develop in the coming years? And uh, we've got to keep in mind also the importance of having the rapprochement between Pakistan and India, the arch rivals, uh, since uh, the 1940s. Uh, to address these issues, we are honored to have uh, the following distinguished guest speakers here with us. Uh, Professor Huang Jing with the Lee Foundation at the National University of Singapore and Mr. Shuram Saram, India's former Foreign Secretary and Chairman of the National Security Advisory Board and the National Security Council. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to Dialogue. Um, uh, India and China have been very influential major economies and uh, um, great civilizations for centuries. And yet, in recent years, people start talking about geopolitical rivalry. I was a little bit surprised, to be honest, largely because of the Doklam chapter, which is over, by the way, and with the success of the Shaman BRICS summit. Looking back, what do you think uh, of the impact of having very constructive uh, uh, bilateral relationship between these two most populous countries in the world? Well, as you said uh, that, um, you know, India-China relations go back many centuries. And if I look at that uh, story of the last few thousand years, uh, there has been very few occasions where you could say that uh, there was a negative relationship between the two countries. Uh, and there has been a very strong cultural link uh, between the two countries uh, as well. But I think we also need to understand that, um, you know, after China's liberation in 1949, uh, India's independence in 1947, I think these two countries have been involved in the very difficult task of nation building, you know, uh, creating a new identity for themselves, even though they are ancient uh, civilizations. And I think in the uh, process of trying to uh, do that nation building, uh, I'm not surprised that um, there sometimes has been a challenge managing the relations between the two countries. Um, by and large, I would say that uh, if we look at how over the last, say, uh, 15 years, how the two countries have uh, managed their relationship, uh, I would say actually they have done a good job. Right. Um, Mr. Saram uh, gave us a strong impression uh, that the two major countries of the world share much the same memories about the colonialism and about how hard it was to win independence. Do you think this similar process culminated with the 1955 Bandung Conference, which was first put forward jointly by uh, Premier Zhou Lai and uh, uh, Prime Minister Nehru, the principle of peaceful, five principles of peaceful coexistence uh, to get rid of colonialization. Now, looking back, what do you think of the common mandates that were in the hands of the leaders from both countries uh, in advancing the process of nation making? I think I just want to follow up what uh, uh, Shayam just said about national identity and national building. Of course, both countries have similar very uh, painful experience in the hands of imperialism. Uh, India has been colonized, China is semi-colonized. So therefore, when the both countries want the so-called independence or liberation of China, they have this kind of illusion or this kind of hope that the two countries, India and the Chinese, bye-bye, can build up their own country, be their own masters for the first time in, uh, ever since the industrialization. So there's a lot of this kind of good hope, but the problem is exactly like that, because the similar experience in the past also seeds the, the seeds the, so the seeds of later prob problem, because both country nationalism come from a negative past. In other words, in the West, I always say the Western nationalism comes from very positive uh, uh, feeling. The bourgeoisie, you know, beat the feudalism. Nation-state building build the royal families, 
it's kind of triumph, it's kind of jubilance. But in China, in the Indians, realize that Indians because of British Raj. Chinese, the Mongols, Han, uh, Tibetans, Uyghurs, we realize we're Chinese because opium war, not that. It's in the beating of the beating of the beating, defeat of the defeat, of the endurance of the sufferance, endurance of injustice, we realize, aha, we are the same nation. So this kind of nationalism actually raised originated from the bitter feeling. So as a result, when the two countries become independent, become their own masters, they're extremely sensitive about who they are, about the nationalism. For example, the, the border issue, I always argue with Sharia. Border issue actually essentially is an internal issue. It's not a bilateral issue because this border is drawn not by the Chinese or by the Indians, or drawn by the British. So the border issue actually embodied a very deep-seated national resentment to the suffering in the past and also a kind of national aspirations and identities. So that's why border issue is very difficult to solve. It is not because the Chinese or Indians don't want to solve this problem, because they have to find a way to positively face in the past before they can really find the truth. For years, uh, not only Indians and Chinese have been wrestling with the issue of uh, colonialism or the legacy of uh, colonization, but the Africans uh, and people in other parts of the world uh, have been facing much the same multiple challenges. Um, given a uh, bit of memories about what happened in 1962 and geopolitically uh, there has been some kind of a rivalry, what do you think of uh, this discourse? Do you think China and India have more competition than cooperation as a result? There are phases when it would appear that uh, the relations are more competitive, but there are also periods when it appears that the relations actually are quite convergent. Uh, so I give you the example of uh, when um, <coughs> I was Foreign Secretary and uh, uh, Prime Minister Wan Xiaopao came to India. Mm -hmm. That was the time when we decided to uh, set up a strategic and cooperative partnership. Now, we would not have thought in terms of a strategic and cooperative partnership if we did not think that the elements of cooperation outweighed the elements of competition between the two countries. Why? Because at that time there was a sense that uh, both India and China, as the two largest emerging economies, if they work together, they could actually have a role to play in shaping the international order on very important issues, global issues, like say climate change or the international trading regime. If India and China, two countries with the largest weight amongst the developing countries, if they work together, they could prob probably achieve much more results than if they were worked on their own. Which is why at that time the phrase was used, India-China relations today have acquired a global dimension. They have acquired a strategic dimension. You have been a senior research fellow with the Brookings uh, Research Institution and uh, looking at the element of Russia from a uh, long distance, what do you think of the role that Russia plays in recruiting India and Pakistan uh, for the Shanghai Corporation Organization and did Russia ever play any role in easing the tensions across the border in Doklam? Uh, which almost destroyed the opportunity of a uh, convergence uh, between India and the Chinese leader in Xiamen for the BRICS summit. Frankly speaking, and uh, you know, we human being, we try to predict future. Everybody understands uh, those who follow cannot. the South Asian yeah. politics. Yeah. Uh, Russia was an uh, ally of India during the Cold War. Yes. Pakistan, the United States, yes. and China were allies uh, in the Cold War. That's exactly the point I want to come. But we cannot predict future. <laughs> but we can learn from the past. So. China, Russia, Indian relationship has a past, not really positive, largely because of Cold War period, especially after 1962. Like you said, former Soviet Union, and India are quasi allies, and China and Pakistan. But that kind of relationship changed fundamentally for three reasons. Reason number one is, of course, Soviet Union disintegrated, collapsed. And after that, for whatever reason, Russia and China has more and more common interest in security areas. And that's the first reason. So in other words, it doesn't serve Russia's interests to the China and India go hand to hand against each other. Because so Russia's major problem come from the United States, come from West, not from China, not from India. So India and China have a stable relationship 
works for Russia's best interest, number one. Number two, Russia would love to be a go-between, even if there's a problem. That's why Russia plays so hard to bring India and China together, because only by doing this, that highlights, exposes Russia's importance in regional stability. So that's why Russia, no, that's the second reason. Last but not the least, of course, Russia thinks that it is, has a kind of relationship with India with special, like your said, weapon. But it also began to build up a kind of cross alliance or partnership with China. So therefore, Russia might play in this kind of constructive role between China and India to show how important Russia is in a bilateral relationship. For that part, I don't mean that Russia works for India's interests or for China's interests. Russia, for its own interests, realized a good relationship, at least workable, reliable, manageable relationship between China and India is in Russia's favor. It's not like before in the Cold War period. So that's why I think answer your question why Russia. But I, just to add to that, that uh, uh, yes, I agree with you that um, uh, Russia would like to see uh, a better relationship between India and China uh, in the larger context of its own relations. But uh, I also believe that um, whether or not India-China relations really improve uh, will depend almost entirely on choices which our two countries make. Yeah. There's yet another important third party regarding the bilateral relationship between New Delhi and Beijing, Pakistan, which has been viewed by peoples in both countries as the old weather relationship, and that's almost the, uh, a month to uh, treaty alliance. However, uh, when it comes to the issue of Kashmir, the Chinese authorities have made it very clear it's the issue between India and Pakistan. China does not want to be dragged into the conflict, but the China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor becomes a hot potato in our effort to build Belt and Road Initiative, and uh, India openly displays its uh, unhappiness. Uh, so to uh, say that, uh, well, India should not really be so worried about what uh, uh, China is doing, building up the China-Pakistan economic corridor through territory, which we say is an integral part of India, uh, is something which uh, China should uh, actually understand why there, <laughs> there is a certain, certain uh, misgivings on the part of uh, India. And as far as the relationship with Pakistan is concerned, uh, we have no issue at all with uh, your all-weather friendship with uh, Pakistan. Uh, our problem with Pakistan is international terrorism. You know, that we have been subjected to uh, cross-border terrorism over many years. Uh, by the way, I understand that even China has sometimes suffered uh, from uh, terrorists who may be based uh, on, on uh, Pakistani territory. Uh, but perhaps you take a different stand on that. But our real problem is uh, terrorism. And you know what this is doing to the people of India, uh, this kind of violence. And um, India and China in fact have repeatedly declared that they stand together in the fight against international terrorism. Senior experts of international days, uh, particularly counter-terrorism experts, have been discussing and debating concepts and definition of terrorism. China made it very clear that we fight all forms of terrorism. A lot happened in the year 2015 between India and Pakistan, and uh, your Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, made a surprise visit to Lahore instead of Islamabad that particular year after he came back from Afghanistan, which, of course, is a very uh, important sphere of influence for India, and Islamabad feels uh, strongly upset about this. Hence, this issue may have brought the two countries together for discussion about the future of South Asia. What do you think of uh, the dynamics of the rapprochement between Islamabad and India? Well, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the surprise visit by Prime Minister Modi to Lahore, because I think it only demonstrates that uh, uh, Indian leaders, and not just Mr. Modi, but his predecessors as well, have repeatedly made very strong efforts to try and establish a much more positive relationship between the two countries. Uh, uh, try and see whether we can build a positive enough relationship so that the two countries can really cooperate together on some of the, in fact, very major issues that both countries are facing in terms of developmental challenges, for example. Uh, so 
the uh, effort has been made precisely on the basis that for India itself to really develop to its full potential. A normalized relationship between India and Pakistan is going to be a very important element in that. Now what happens is that every time we have tried to make that take that kind of initiative, we have been answered with cross-border terrorism and which brings the relationship back again to, you know, you, you, what you say seem to uh, give a ring of truth uh, about the peace process in the Middle East. Whenever there was a silver lining about the progress there, there's always a destabilizing force to sabotage the dynamics. Uh, what that destabilizing force is? Uh, who are the people who do not have an interest in seeing India-Pakistan relations improve? That is something for analysts to uh, try and uh, examine. But what I'm telling you is precisely what we have the experience that we have had for so many uh, years. So I think it is uh, very important that um, um, not only should the uh, leadership in uh, Pakistan uh, see its own interests, in trying to cooperate with India in dealing with international terrorism. Because Pakistan says itself is a victim of uh, terrorism. Right. And as far as Afghanistan is concerned, let me uh, make the point. There is no issue of India trying to seek a sphere of influence in Afghanistan. India's relations with Afghanistan go back again centuries. You know. and, uh, Very much is, like uh, in the case of Myanmar. Uh, very much like in the case of <laughs> Myanmar as well. Why not? For those who not, do not uh, follow very closely politics and geopolitics uh, in South Asia and the process of uh, post-war reconstruction in Afghanistan, they may see the influence of India there as part of the hegemonic uh, uh, ambition, uh, like the enormous influence of India in South Asia, where China would find it very difficult to set up our presence to pen penetrate with our constructive investment and therefore some of the Chinese observers may say hey maybe this is the what we call the moral doctrine or the Indian equivalent of moral doctrine in South Asia what do you think of the Chinese concerns first I disagree with that you disagree I, I think that I do not believe India want to block China or any other country to have play a constructive role in South Asia. Actually, China has been playing a very constructive role. But India has been very sensitive to the yes. presence of Chinese business there. Yes, I think India, just like China, have internal policy debate. But going back to this Pakistan issue, I think India and China both see the same problem oranges, but the approach are different. That's why it's different. Because number one, they said Pakistan and Afghanistan, the number one problem is still nation state building. The nation state building needs to be improved. We see international terrorism coming from these two countries, Israel and Pakistan, largely because the government capability is not as strong as it should be. It's weak. So therefore, even though the Pakistan leadership or Pakistan government said we want to stop it, but they cannot do it. I do not really agree or buy the argument that the Pakistani government deliberately want to do that to sabotage the China or India. I think it's because they really cannot be held accountable for those bad things happened origin from their country. So that's the problem we all see. But the problem is that Chinese government, the China's approach is this. They want to improve nation state building by helping Pakistan build a strong nation state first, economically, politically, so therefore they can use their own force to contain terrorism. But India may be a little bit impatient. India want to want them to contain terrorism first and then talking about nation state building. The check and the egg questions. Uh, the two major countries in South Asia went to war three times. Uh, they have become a nuclear armed. Um, uh, but neither is a party to the NPT. And therefore, China says, and one of the spokespersons from the Chinese Foreign Ministry even came to my program and made it very clear China does not support India to be a member of the, non, uh, of the nuclear suppliers group. It New Delhi became very unhappy. So can you ex elaborate why you uh, have shown defiance to the NPT? Why did China show defiance to the NPT before it joined in 1992? I mean, China's position on the NPT was no different from India. And China, on the same grounds, had actually opposed the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, it has changed its position. It is most welcome uh, to it. Uh, 
I think what uh, so needs you're going to follow the China uh, uh, Roe example. Uh, no, I'm 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 only trying to explain that you know uh, don't please take a moralist position on you know why is India opposing the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, please go back to your own history and see why you oppose the non-proliferation treaty at one point of time. Secondly, as far as the nuclear supplies group is concerned, which operates by consensus and therefore China's support is very important. I would like to ask why did China see it's in its interest not to oppose the waiver that was given to India in 2008 by the nuclear supplies group which enabled India to engage in international commerce in nuclear take, energy. I think that every country has its own interest in the history. Of course, you just mentioned 1992, but the one thing that happened in 1991 is the Soviet Union collapse. Because at those years, the Soviet Union was seen as former Soviet Union as a number one. I, I said that uh, yeah. there may be good reason for that. <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> we have to be very careful. Uh, uh, when China began to develop its nuclear weapons, eventually China joined the MPT. There is a process that China is not as much defined as Indian did in 1990s, because India's defiance to the international rule is, is obvious. So if your logic can be followed, then we have no reason against countries like, see, North Korea, because those nuclear haves should not have the privilege against those nuclear have not. That's India's position. And if also follow the case the of Iran. Logic, then Iran, North uh, Korea can follow uh, the same. Uh, Logic, Did right? not China follow that logic in 1963? No. Yes. Because, because they said, the China, like India said, how can you have three a three major, three uh, major differences. Yeah. In 1963, China is highly isolated. China's national security is in big danger because two major powers, two hegemons, United States and Soviet Union, both try to enclose China. And India, of course, plays. And you think that uh, India becoming a nuclear weapon state in 1998 was not uh, uh, linked to the threat that India faced? In, 1990, so in 1996, look over. Let, let if, you, if you are talking about, if you are talking about justification, you cannot claim that China's security interest has greater priority than India's security. Yeah, but let me give you some. Yeah. In 1964, when China had nuclear weapons, only less than 60 countries officially recognized China as a sovereign state. Mo so that's why China always be grateful to India. India recognized China from the very beginning. But when you, India have nuclear weapons, almost every country on Earth has a normal relationship with India. No country on Earth claim India as number one enemy. But 1964, China is nationally uh, highly isolated. Uh, you know, China has uh, two major enemies, in, in, in uh, both East and the West, I, and I also think, India. I think you are... You are and China uh, badly need yeah. nuclear weapons to guarantee the new uh, national uh, You know, if you, if you look at the drivers of India's uh, becoming a nuclear yes. weapon state, uh, it is very, very intimately linked to the threat that it has perceived, yes. both from what was happening on its, say, in its neighborhood with Pakistan, which was developing a clandestine nuclear weapon program, and also the fact that there was a nuclear uh, weapon state, uh, very uh, important nuclear weapon state, uh, neighboring it in, in, in China. No, I, so to say that, my last uh, point. You to say that India's uh, security was not really threatened, but you know, China's was, I think you should let India decide uh, what its uh, security yes, interests. Yes, that's my point. <laughs> I think at that time, India has two really security concerns. Number one is a China which is very friendly to Pakistan. Number two, both China and the United States took a not impartial, partial attitudes towards the Indian's nuclear weapon system and Pakistani weapon system. Because the United States never believed Pakistan have a nuclear weapons, and China, according to India's perceptions, helped Pakistan a little bit. But that one thing is true, I, and I believe uh, your memory uh, would support my uh, argument. China supported uh, the economic sanctions imposed by the UN Security Council against both India and, uh, and Pakistan for the nuclear test in 1998. The last uh, question is very much about your traditional foreign policy about non-aligned movement. India is one of the leaders of this movement. Do you see a going east policy by New Delhi and that targets China? So what do you think of the, uh, the, the alleged end of your pursuit of a non-aligned movement? You know, India's position has been that um, 
if we are going to construct a enduring security architecture in Asia, Asia Pacific, it has to be inclusive, it has to be transparent, it has to be balanced, and it should really serve the interests of all the countries. Why? Because all of us, whether it is China, whether it is India, whether it is the countries of the region, whether it is the users of the ocean space, like the United States, all of us are dependent upon the security of the sea lanes of communication. All of us. Now, each one of us can decide that the only way we can ensure the uh, the security of the sea lands for ourselves is by the unilateral buildup of our military strength or banding together with this country or that country or you can actually work together with the other countries to construct a security architecture of mutual reassurance. The essence of Belt and Road Initiative aims to be inclusive. Uh, it's uh, unlike uh, the outdated uh, Yalta framework or the bread and woods that tends to reject the participation by emerging markets uh, in the uh, international financial system. What's your take about the non-aligned movement and the new or renewed foreign policy under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi? Non-alignment movement still carry a lot of movement of India's foreign policy. But I think I've noticed one word you just said, India wants inclusive, transparent and balanced. I think the focus is a balanced. India wants a balanced relationship especially from Modi's point of view, he believes China's rapid rise may have a tendency to break the balance. That's why Indian, my, my observation is to try to maintain or reestablish a kind of balance in which Indian were in a favorable position. That's why Indian began to work with Japan or United States and so forth. It's not really against China, but to maintain so kind of geopolitical balance. But Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping said a long time ago, China does not play the so-called geopolitical game. So Belt and Road Initiative is an economic development scale. But there is a danger, both in China and outside China, some people try to politicize Belt and Road Initiative. That is very counterproductive. Thank you so much.